When I was uh, watching the news last night, I thought very seriously, considered very seriously just changing my topic for this morning. Um, but then the more I thought about it, I realized that, that we live in a time where no one has any answers. <laughs> There's something fitting about thinking about how do we live without answers, and if you're a parent, how do you parent without answers, because we're never going to have all the answers, and if you wanted any proof of that, just watch the news today. And we live in a chaotic world and a chaotic society, and, and there's an instability, there's a, a fragility to all that's going on, and I don't know how it's going to play out. I wish I did. I can tell you the long game, but I can't tell you what's coming tomorrow or even this afternoon. And, and one of the unique privileges and responsibilities as a parent is that, that not only you're trying to navigate this crazy, chaotic world where you don't have all the answers for yourself, but you get to do it with kids. And they're experiencing it in real time with you. And so for us last night, you know, we're, we're watching the news like so many of you are online, we're seeing all this happen, and I've got kids who are sitting there watching it going, what is happening? Why is this happening? How did this happen? Right? And so we're trying to make sense of it and thinking about like, is this really where we are as a society? Is this really where we are as a nation? How do we think about it? How do we process it? How do we pray through this? Where is God in this? And at the same time, in real time, we get to try to do that with our kids, right? That's, that's exciting. I told one of my kids last night, I said, hey, buddy, you are living history right now. Like, this will be in the history books. And I got to tell you that, I feel like I say that far too often these days. I'd like it to be a little bit less in the history books. How about you? But I told him, I said, listen, two things you need to know. God is in control, but I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen next. I do not have all the answers. And, and I remember... When, I was, when we were first having kids and thinking, you know, when you're parents, you kind of think, well, I have to have all the answers, don't you? You're like, oh, these, these, these lives, they, you know, those children, they're looking up to me. I better have all the answers, you know, never say I don't know. I better have all the responses and be able to make all the decisions and never get anything wrong. And, and that was my thought before we actually had our first child. And then when they gave us our first child, you know, you're leaving the hospital and you're looking at those hospital workers and it's like, this is negligence. Why would you give this child to me? Are you crazy right now? Like, what about me gave you confidence that you would give this life and entrust this life to me? And so very quickly, I was like, I don't have all the answers. And then you're going, well, where's the instruction manual? Right? I, I don't see it. I'm trying to figure out where's the instruction manual. And the reality is there is no instruction manual. And I remember... Um, People gave us parenting books, and then we bought a bunch of parenting books, and all the Christian parenting books, they all pointed uh, to one verse in particular. They said, oh, this is your confidence right here, Proverbs 22, 6, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not re re uh, turn from it. And I remember thinking, that sounds great. I just wish the author could have been a little more specific. Like, that's just now filling in a whole lot of gaps for me, right? I mean, at one level, is the Bible an instruction manual for life? Yes, at one level. But I got to tell you, I've been through this quite a bit, and it doesn't cover everything. Like, I have yet to find anything on smartphones, <laughs> right? There's, there's nothing about the age that you should let someone get on social media. My opinion is never. But that's, you know, right? So, so there's, there's all sorts of things that we wrestle with as parents that you're not going to find like, which way should my child go? Like, which college should they go to? Where should they major in so that in 20 years, when AI takes over the world, they still have a job, right? How, how do they navigate the complexities of this world? And, and I know I'm speaking to some of you, and you're not parents, but, but let's just face the reality that this is the journey that all of us are on. Some of us could just get the joy of trying to help someone else navigate it, but these are the questions that all of us face. We are in a crazy, chaotic, ever-changing, come at you 90 miles an hour and then some world, and it feels like there are so many wrong ways to go, so many ways that we can get this wrong. So how do you live when you don't have all the answers? How do you raise kids when you don't have all the answers? And what I love about the book of Proverbs and why I come back to it again and again is because Proverbs goes beyond the search for all the right answers. And it recognizes that, that the solution to life is not in having all the right answers. You're never gonna have all the right answers. You're never gonna make all the right decisions. 
And if you're a parent, man, you know that, you feel that, you've already made mistakes. You've already done things you wish you could take back, but what Proverbs is telling you, that the the only real path forward, it's not in trying to solve all the uh, right answers, it's being the right person. And that as a, a parent, our job is not to try to give our kids all the right answers, that's a fool's errand, it's try to help them to become the right kind of people who can navigate life well. And so in Proverbs 23, Starting in verse 15, it says, My son, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Do not, do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise, and keep your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad. May she who gave you birth rejoice. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes keep to my ways. And historically, we attribute the Proverbs to King Solomon. And, and what we believe is that not only did he write a whole lot of these Proverbs, but he was also collecting them from, from the regions around Israel. And one of the common uh, patterns, if you will, of, of po- Proverbs is that it's often a parent speaking to a child. They are giving wisdom to their children. And so this is the model, but this, this is a parent speaking to a child, perhaps Solomon himself speaking to one of his kids. So in verse 15, to go back, says, My son, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Isn't that interesting? He, he says, when your heart is wise, my heart is glad. And there's something about being a parent that, that you, you know this, that you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. You're only as good as your kids are. If you have a child who's struggling, that is the level of struggle that you will be experiencing in life. There's a connection that you have, this deep empathy that you have for your children, the love that you have for your children. So Solomon is recognizing this and he says, look, if your heart is wise, if you are thriving, if you are making wise decisions and living the right way, then then man, I'm good. Like I love it when my kids thrive. And he says, says, when your lips speak what is right, in other words, when your soul, which is out of which everything that you say flows, when your soul is healthy, he says, my soul, my inmost being will rejoice. When your soul is healthy, my soul rejoices. And then later in verses 24 and 5, he says much the same thing. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad. May she who gave you birth rejoice. I mean, I I love it when my kids are doing well for that brief moment (laughs) before there's the next crisis. But when you see your kids thriving, doing something they love, you're seeing them make good choices. When you see wisdom and maturity, man, it does my heart good. I love that. There's nothing better than seeing your kids live well. And see, this goes beyond just seeing them, you know, get good grades and and get a good education and maybe get a good job or be successful. Those are all great. I mean, probably all of us as parents, we have dreams for our kids. And we we want them to get into the right college and major in something they love and follow their passions and dreams and and maybe have, you know, families and make us grandkids, you know, grandparents, maybe not too soon, you know, but, but we have all those dreams. But there's something, if we're honest, if we really stop, that goes beyond that. There's a depth of desire for our children that we have that that has to do with their soul, has to do with their character, who they really are. What I really want for my kids is for them to live lives of wisdom, of courage, of resilience, of love, of compassion that speaks to the, the health of their soul and their character. And see, really, this is the same desire that I have for myself, right? This is who I want to be. Have you ever watched a movie, you know, maybe it's a TV show or something, and you see a moment, and it's so heroic. 
You know, I, I saw um, uh, there's a new Gladiator movie coming out, and I remember the old Gladiator, and, and it's like, yes, heroism, sacrifice for the greater good. And, it's, and you see that, and you think, wow, so cool, and something wells up inside of you. And you sort of think, wow, I wish I could be like that. Like if I was in that position, man, I would be brave and courageous like that as well. Right? There's something in those moments that communicate to us who God has created us to be. Right? There's, there's these moments where we see acts of compassion or forgiveness that, that move us. And, it, and by the way, these happen in real life as well. Right? I'm not just saying, you know, maybe you see it in a movie, it's dramatized, but, but I don't know about you, but I was watching the news last night and I saw Secret Service agents spring into action. Like that is heroism, that is courage to place themselves in harm's way and to say, hey, if there's a bullet out there, I'm gonna take it. Right? See, that's an act of courage. And I found myself thinking, man, those guys are amazing. If I was in that position, I like to think that that's what I would do. Now, I don't know. I haven't been in that position. I hope never am. But if I am, if I'm ever in a crowd, man, I'm not the guy, I don't wanna be the guy who's like, you know, carrying the kids, good luck, I'm over here. I'm gonna be like, no, 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 my body is a blanket. Like that's the guy I want to be. That's the person that I want to be. And and so when we see those moments, there's something that communicates to us and says, yeah, this this is what you were meant for. This is who God created you to be, to be a person of courage. You know, Carrie and I have a really close friend and she has twice battled cancer and didn't know if she would make it. And twice we have seen her struggle through that with such courage. And she's not just concerned for herself, but she is, as she is struggling through that, as she is fighting for her life, she is also trying to protect her children and shelter them so that they're not traumatized for life. Younger children, and it's like being honest with them, trying to walk them through it, I mean, that is an amazing courage. It's amazing compassion to even while she's suffering to think more about her kids than herself. Right, you see that and think, man, if I have to go through it, I hope I have that kind of courage. I have a friend who lost tens of thousands of dollars in a a deal with a guy from church who cheated him. And yet... Not that long after, after it was all said and done, he told me, oh yeah, I, I've forgiven him and I'm reaching out to him, I'm trying to restore our friendship. And there was no thought in it. He was like, oh, the money's gone, I'm not even worried about that. And this is not a wealthy person going, oh, I can write off tens of thousands of dollars. Like, this was somebody who was gonna have to be paying it off. And he said, yeah, but my relationship with him, his heart, Like, I'm worried about him. I care more about him. I'm forgiving him, and I'm gonna reach out to him and see if we can work something out and restore this. And if he pays me back, wonderful, praise God. But if not, I care more about him than the money. It's just money. And I see that, and I think, man, if I'm in that position, I hope that I can have that level of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And see, this is not just what we want for our children, but it's what we want for ourselves, isn't it? to be the the right kind of person, right? But this is what I'm praying for for my kids, that they would have this kind of courage and resilience and compassion and love, this kind of greatness within them. Because when they are the right kind of person, then they're gonna have a successful life no matter what. See, there's a kind of success that you don't ever see put on a wall or on a billboard or on TV. There's a kind of success that simply comes with being approved by God and who you are as a person. And what I want for my children is for them to have that kind of success because then their life is unstoppable. Like you can't disrupt someone with that kind of courage. You can't disrupt someone with that kind of compassion and mercy and grace. Like it doesn't matter what you throw at them, they're just gonna roll with it. And they're like, oh, this is hard, but this is who God has made me to be. And I will step into that space in the way that that God will approve of. This is who you become. You can handle all of life's difficulties and challenges, but becoming that kind of person, understand it doesn't come easily. Right, you don't flip a switch. It's like, oh look, now I have courage. Oh look, now I'm compassionate. Like this is something that takes time as God shapes you and molds you. And part of that is is learning the skill of seeing the future. See, 
the wise person and the person who becomes wise has the ability to see how their life will play out and to choose a better option than the immediate gratification that the world throws at us. See, wisdom plays out the scene and says, instead of running for cover, I'm gonna stand in harm's way because this is the person that I want to be. But it's also the person who says, I see the decision right in front of me and I realize that if I take this decision, it is going to lead me in a path that I do not want to go. And so the wise person sees how every decision plays out and asks the question, who will I become if I follow this out in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Like, who will I become? What will my future look like? And this is what Solomon is saying here in verse 17. Do not always let your heart, do not let your heart envy sinners. But always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness close them in rags. See, one of the major challenges, if you're a parent, you understand this, is trying to help your kids see the future. Because you see all the bad decisions, and you're like, oh no, I know where that's going. Don't go that way, turn around, go this way. And you see it, but they can't see the future. So you're trying to tell them this is the future, and they're like, I don't believe you. And then sometimes you see their friends who are moving that direction. You're like, no, don't envy sinners. Right? Don't be chasing after them and the way that they're going. It's not going to end well for you. Turn around, go in a different direction. Because if you don't, you're going to jeopardize your future. And see, in, in Proverbs, it says, do not, let, do not let your heart envy sinners. In Proverbs, sin, uh, sinfulness always is associated with foolishness. It's to be foolish is to sin. So let me put this as bluntly as I can. Sin makes you stupid. Okay? See, to sin is foolish. It's stupid because you are, in that moment, you are, you are living apart from the reality of God and, and the reality of who he's created you to be and the reality of his world. Like you are living in an alternate universe, essentially. You're saying, oh, this is good when it's not good. And so you're choosing foolishness. But as you sin... Every time you do, you set yourself on a pattern where the more sin, the more sin, the more sin, it will erode your moral compass. And eventually, you can't make a wise decision. You can't tell right from wrong. You just think everything's fine, even though everybody around you is watching you destroy your life. It, it, it's one decision that you think is so insignificant, but it will set you on a trajectory because every time you do it, it gets a little easier, a little easier, a little easier. And that little conscience voice inside of you or even the Holy Spirit, you just keep muting it, muting it, muting it until you don't know right from wrong. And I'll tell you, um, on Friday, I was, uh, I was worn out. Um, you know, so many of you helped us with VBS. It was a long week, wasn't it? I mean, it was awesome, but I was exhausted every night. And then, you know, you take the kids home and Monday night, Eleanor had fallen asleep that afternoon. And if she sleeps, we're toast because then at 11 o'clock, she's like knocking on our door and she's like, I'm awake. And I'm like, I don't want to be, you know, we're just like, please go to bed, child. And so we hit Friday and I was just wiped out and I finished my last appointment. And normally when I finish work on Friday, I go to the gym. And I knew I was gonna have to be back at the church anyway for VBS and Carrie wasn't expecting me to come home. And so I'm on my way to the gym and there's this little voice. I thought, you know what? What I could do though, I could skip the gym. I could just go back to the office. Nobody's there. It's so quiet. And, and I thought, and I don't wanna work. I'm exhausted. I, you know what? I could go back to the office and I could just watch a TV show. You know, just check out for a little while. I mean, I deserve that, right? Like, I'm entitled to that. Just, I mean, nobody needs to know. I'll just skip the gym. I'll go back to the office. I'll just look like I got to VBS early. And then I thought, but where will that end? Like, yeah, it seems innocent enough. You do it one week, but you know what? The next week, it might get a little easier to make that decision. The next week, a little bit easier, a little bit easier. The next thing you know, man, I've been watched all of Netflix, and Carrie's wondering why I'm putting on some pounds. Right? She's like, I thought you were going to the gym. Oh, I've been watching TV, right? So where is this going to end? Who will I become? How many of you can think back to a time where you stood at a place, a crossroads? And what's so 
dangerous as they can seem so innocent. It's just a little decision. It's just one moment where you respond in the wrong way, where you never quite get around to saying you're sorry. You never quite mend that relationship. You never quite come clean when you were dishonest or a little lie that you told. It's just those little moments, but they just make the next one that much easier. And you lose sight of the future in favor of what's right in front of you then. And see, foolish people can't see the future. They're caught up in the here and now. They only see what their appetite wants right then. And they can't see how their present actions will affect them in the long run. This is why he says, look, this is what happens when you drink too much wine. When you gorge yourselves on meat, drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. And see, the warning is, if you can't see the future so that you're only living for the present, immediate, instant gratification, fill your stomach, then you're going to end up in poverty, either literally, which is what he's describing, or spiritually. I mean, you might not lose all of your money, but can I tell you that addictions come in all shapes and sizes? And you can be addicted to wealth, and you might be great fiscally, financially, super wealthy, doing great, but be spiritually destitute. And see, what all addictions have in common, and like I said, gluttony or, or being drunk, right? But any addiction, right, what they all have in common is that the more you give of yourself, the more they demand and the less they give. And so what starts off as, you know, just a little something, over time, it's like, oh, no, you need more, and you need more, and you need more. And in return, that addiction is giving you less and less and less until you get to the point where your soul is shriveled up to nothing. Right? Your soul is spiritually destitute. Your soul is spiritually bankrupt. And you can have all the money, wealth, success, anything that you want, but it won't change that inside you are poor. And what Solomon wants us to see is that there's a correlation between how well you can see your future and the potential hope that you have for your future and falling into destructive habits. Because self-destructive patterns are fueled by hopelessness. I've talked with a lot of people who have struggled through addiction of all different kinds. Some that make the, the list of normal addictions, if you will, are the ones that we expect, and some not so much. Because like I said, all addictions have the same qualities in, in common. But what I found in those conversations is that it always begins with a moment where they lost hope. It began with a moment where they lost sight of the future or whatever they thought their future was, was not hopeful. And so out of the hopelessness, even of that moment, they made a decision that set them on a path of self-destruction. And what's so dangerous about this is that once you start on that path, then those self-destructive patterns will actually continue to fuel your sense of hopelessness. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense or a vicious cycle. And so I feel hopeless, therefore I take these steps that will make me feel better in the immediate, but rob me of my future. And then afterwards, by the way, I feel horrible about myself and my sense of hopelessness, which drives me again back to that thing that I wish I wasn't doing. But it makes me feel good right now. And they do that over and over and over again as hopelessness drives you to this pattern that then fuels your hopelessness and over time you can't tell the difference between right and wrong even though everyone around you is screaming stop living that way and you lose yourself and you lose your soul and see the only way to break out of that cycle is knowing the, the hope that you have in God right that he is the one who holds your future see when you lose sight of your future and you lose sight of that hope, it's because at some point you lost sight of God. 
Because God can handle whatever is coming your way, right? God is in control. And you say, okay, this is what God is calling me to. This is the future. God is in control. So whatever I'm experiencing right now, know that ultimately I have hope. But if I lose sight of that, I let go of God, and then I fall into these destructive patterns. You with me? And so the only way to then break out of it is to be reminded, and this is, by the way, why we come back to Scripture over and over again. It's why we come back to church over and over again. Because the only way to break out of that cycle then is to be reminded of the truth that God holds your future. Like, if you are holding on to God, then you have hope, I promise you. If you've given your life to Jesus, you have hope. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world or in our politics or whatever. You have hope, so you don't have to settle for the immediate gratification. You don't have to settle for something smaller than what God has desires for you. This is what Solomon says right here, do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. If you hold on to that, then you don't lose sight of your future, you don't fall into these destructive patterns, you don't end up destitute, either literally or spiritually. See, when, when we talk to our kids, um, one of the things we, we tell them is, is we don't want you to fill anyone's shoes but your own. You, you ever have someone, maybe you had an older brother or sister, and uh, somebody told you along the way, you got big shoes to fill. Or maybe you were taking over a job that someone else did a phenomenal job with, and you were taking that position, like, oh, you got big shoes to fill. And what we always tell our kids is, you don't fill anyone's shoes but your shoes, just yours. Your future is your future, uniquely created for you, but the shoe size that you were created for, you're like a six right now. You were created for a 20. You have some growing to do. And see, we settle for a future that's like baby shoe sized. And we're trying to like shoehorn our big feet in there. And we're like, oh, this is it. This is all that we really have. But God does not create small futures. He only gives you very, very, very large shoes to fill. They're yours. You just have to grow into them. And when we compromise on the future that God created us for, then we are settling for a future that is too small. We're settling for a future that is less than what God desires for us, what he created us for. But see, the wise person knows better. The wise person knows better because wisdom allows you to see the future that you're building with every decision that you make and to course correct if need be. And so in verse 19, he says, listen, my son, and be wise and keep your heart on the right path. In verse 22, he says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. See, it's interesting the way that he, he puts truth with wisdom, discipline, and understanding. They're all wrapped up together. Now, they're not all the same, but they all work together because truth has to be lived in order for it to make you wise, for it to count in your life. Right? It's like if, if, if you told me that you wanted to become a whitewater rafting pilot, you know, you're, you're the guy driving the boat, or steering the boat down the rapids. And you said, man, I've taken a class. I watched a YouTube video. I read a book. Let's go to Colorado. You hop in the raft with me, and we are good to go. I'd be like, not a chance, (laughs) right? So you can have all the truth that you want, but you have yet to become wise because you haven't applied it which means that you get on the white water rapids and it doesn't matter. I'm great, thrilled that you know more than I do. You have some idea of how to steer a boat, but let's see how you do first before I get in with you. I'm gonna go find the seasoned veteran who's spent the last 20 years on the river. I'm gonna get in with him because he's skilled at applying the knowledge that he has. And he's had years of, of learning and learning and learning, becoming wise and skillful in this. And see, wisdom means possessing the skill of applying what you know, that truth, in a way that you actually get the result that you want. It's applying what you know in the right way, in the right time, in the right moment, so that it turns out the right way. See, wisdom equips you in life to navigate all of life's twists and turns as well as avoiding the traps along the way so that you don't turn over the raft 
because you can't anticipate all that the river is going to be. And the power of wisdom, then, is that you don't have to know everything that's coming because you can't. And yet, when you're skilled at living, when you have wisdom, you can handle whatever comes your way. Doesn't mean that it's easy. Doesn't mean that there's not tense times. Doesn't mean that you don't make a mistake and have to course correct. But the more skilled you are, the wiser you are, the more you are able to navigate life when you don't have all the answers. But see, you need truth because truth is the foundation for wisdom. You can't have wisdom without truth. That's like trying to build wisdom on a lie or make-believe. Like you can, you can uh, know the truth but live in a fantasy world. Like I don't know about you, I like to live in a fantasy world where meat lover's pizza actually makes me healthy and thinner, right? <laughs> See, I know it's not true. I know it will drive up my cholesterol, but I like to live in this fantasy world. But it doesn't matter what I believe about me lover's pizza or how I try to lie to myself, the reality of me lover's pizza stays the same. It's going to affect me. And so sometimes reality, when you don't respect it, it slaps you upside the face. And so there is, there is a world that God has made. And this is, by the way, the world that we're in right now. In case you were confused, this world God made, which means there are right ways and wrong ways to live. There are ways that life is going to work out better, ways that I can pretty much guarantee you, you are going to ruin everything, all of your plans. Like you will destroy your future. And see, what happens is we, we try to live in this fantasy world where meat lover's pizza doesn't make us fat, and then later on we're like, dude, what happened? And then we're frustrated. Well, you're not living in light of the reality that God has created. And, and so then we are frustrated, and God is going, guys, there's principles, there's way to live, there's wisdom. Follow me, I will show you. Stop getting frustrated that life isn't working the way that you want and listen to God and who knows what might happen. Just a thought. And so what Solomon says then is that when you find someone who's wise, someone who does know how to live life skillfully, who does know how to apply truth in a way that will lead to the future that you want, he says, then buy truth from them. I love this. Listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she's old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. And skip down to verse 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes keep to my ways. So you find someone who has truth, who has wisdom, and then you invest your life with them. You spend time with them. You learn from them. You glean from them. And evidently, Solomon thinks that as parents, we should have something to offer our kids. Because repeatedly, he says, listen to your father. Don't despise your mother. My son, give me your heart. Let your eyes keep to my ways. He's not, he's not saying, oh, parents, just give them the old do as I say, not as I do line. He says, no, you as a parent, you should be a source of truth and wisdom for your child. And what that means is that he has a very pointed question for all of us who are parents. What kind of life are you modeling for your kids? How well are you following the wisdom that God has given us and the wisdom of skillfully applying the truth that we find in his word and putting it into practice in your life? How well... Are you living your life in front of your children? That you could say, follow me. Keep your eyes on me. Follow my ways. Imitate me. Not that you're perfect. But even when you mess up, you can say, follow me as you see how I course correct. As I repent. As I seek forgiveness. And by the way, this is true for you whether you're a parent or whether you're not. If you don't have kids, maybe you have younger siblings, maybe you've got nephews and nieces, maybe you've got grandkids, I don't know. I guess if you had grandkids, you would have been a parent at some point, but you have someone in your life with whom you have influence. Maybe it's someone at work, maybe it's a neighbor. So what kind of life are they seeing in you? Like what path are you on? Are you on a, the path that is leading to the future that God has created for you or have you settled for a future without any real purpose, any real direction, any real meaning? You know, in, in John 14, 6, 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And sometimes I know there are those who will chafe at this because if they don't like that, it sounds like Jesus is being really exclusive and he's being really difficult and he's, you know, flexing. It's only through me. But what Jesus is saying here is that this is reality. Like this is the reality of our situation as human beings, as humanity, that we are lost and broken and we are separated from God because of sin. That is our reality. And Jesus is the only one who's come to save us. He's the only one who bridges that gap. He is the reality. He is the truth. He is the way. He is life. He is all of it. He is the answer that we are looking for. And see, this isn't some sort of abstract theory or theological um, uh, idea. This is reality, but you have to live the truth for it to count. If, if you want the reality of Jesus to make a difference in your life, then you can't simply know that Jesus is who he says he is, you actually have to trust in him. You have to place your faith in him and allow him to change your life. And so maybe you're here this morning and, and you're at a place where you need to have an honest conversation with God. You need to get alone with him and to have a, a real frank conversation about the reality of your heart, the reality of your life. What kind of life are you living? Is it one that others can imitate? Is it one that others can follow? whether it's your kids, your grandkids, or the people around you, what kind of life are you living? And is there a way that God needs to change your life to realign it with the reality of who he is and the world that he's created? And maybe you already know the answer to that. If we were to pause and you were to be honest, maybe you immediately, something comes to mind, this isn't, this isn't who I should be. Or maybe you're at a place where you need to have an honest conversation with God about just your relationship with him to, to begin with. To enter into a relationship with him for the first time. And maybe you've heard the name of Jesus, maybe you've been around church all of your life, but maybe you've just sort of been playing the game and you've never come to a place where you stopped and you were honest before God about the reality of your situation and said, I am lost without you. I cannot create the life that I want. I cannot create the future that I want. Jesus, I'm asking you to save me and to trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins and the promise of a future hope that cannot be taken away. One of the assumptions within the Proverbs is that not only that as parents we should be able to give wisdom to our kids, but in many ways, it's that we benefited from parents who gave us wisdom. And I know that that's not the case for all of us. There are some of you who, the idea of your mom or your dad being a source of wisdom and truth, nothing could be further from reality. And I want you to know that there is still a father who loves you. There is a heavenly father who knows you better than you know yourself, who loves you imaginably more than you can possibly comprehend. And he is the source of all the wisdom, all the truth, all the life that you need. And Jesus is the way. Before the foundation of the world, the Father spoke to the Son and they conspired to save us. And Jesus said, I will go. I will rescue them. I'm coming for them. And so if you've never given your life to Jesus and you're looking for that father, I want you to know that this morning you can take that step. And you can give your life to Jesus. You can trust in him for all who he says he is, that he is the way to the father and you can step into a new relationship with God today. And you can come home. It's the future you've been looking for. He's the answer that you need. Let's pray. Father, we live in a time where it just seems like there are more questions than answers. And there is so much that we don't know and we don't understand that we can't predict. And there's so many voices telling us so many con contradicting things. It is, wow, it's exhausting. 
And Lord, I know that, like myself, there are some of us, we're just living with a heaviness this morning and a sadness over just the state of our nation and just what we've seen, and it's very sobering. And, uh, and last night's events just have just brought it to a head. And so, Lord, I pray that um, we would um, be honest about that reality, and at the same time, we would hold on to the hope that you offer, that we would hold on so tightly that you are the rock of our foundation. You are the anchor for our soul. And Lord, there may be someone here this morning and in the midst of, perhaps it's a personal crisis, perhaps it's what they've seen in the news and, and they are questioning your goodness. Do you really love them? Are you really here for them? Father, I pray that right now you would speak to them and that they would see that the reality of Jesus who gave his life for them, that your love is inescapable, that your love is undeniable, and that, they, that you love them in a way that is too deep for words. Lord, I pray that we would be in awe of your love today. It would saturate our souls. It would bring us new life. And it would give us the courage to step into the future that you've created us for as we embrace a world that is so, so terrified and to give an answer for the hope that we have. It's in your name we pray, amen.